you, Madhu. Dr. Kim is our, uh, one of our heart failure transplant cardiologists, is a co-director for the cardiac CVICU, uh, cardiac ICU, uh, and uh, is an integral part of our team. And he's going to talk about what do you do when you have a new onset heart failure. All right. <clears throat> Thank you very much. So I'm going to go over a, um, a case-based approach um, in the initial evaluation of someone who's got heart failure. <clears throat> and uh, no, no disclosures. At times, I wish I had some. <clears throat> so learning objectives, I'm just going to briefly review the definition and classifications of heart failure uh, based largely on a lot of the, the, um, the writings of Dr. Butler, who wrote some of the guidelines uh, that, that we're going to review. And then I'm going to take you through a case of a patient that we recently saw um, to direct the initial evaluation of heart failure. So, Heart failure itself, as, as all of you know, is a very complex and it's a clinical syndrome that results from any kind of structural or functional impairment of ventricular filling uh, or ejection of blood. So it is a, um, <clears throat> the key words there, I think it's a complex and clinical syndrome. And it uh, spans a, a large uh, spectrum of disorders of patients who has a normal left ventricular size with normal uh, ejection fraction to those who have an enlarged or remodeled ventricle with poor ejection fraction. And the classifications here are, are the first breakdown is based on ejection fraction. And those folks who have an ejection fraction less than 40% are, are classified as those having reduced ejection fraction. And, and, and those above 50 are classified as having preserved ejection fraction. Now, there is a small cohort, not a small cohort, there's a um, <coughs> that, uh, class of folks that fall, fall in the middle of 40 to 50, uh, which kind of fall into this borderline or, or improved ejection fraction, uh, whose characteristics are more consistent with HEF-PEF. <clears throat> but I highlighted the HEF-REF here because that's going to be uh, what we focus on today. Now, the other ways to classify heart failure, <clears throat> the uh, ACC, AHA stages of heart failure, and the NYHA or New York Heart Association functional classifications. Uh, provide complementary evidence or, or information to <clears throat> classify folks on the spectrum of disease and the progression of disease, as well as assessing a patient's uh, symptoms or their functional limitation. So in terms of the ACC, AHA classifications or stages of heart failure, as you have risk factors and you develop disease, you often go down from ABCD and it's sort of a rigid system where once you progress, it's hard to go back. Uh, as far uh, as opposed to the New York Heart Association, functional classifications are a little bit more fluid depending on whether you're able to diurese them or put them on neural uh, hormonal modulation to improve their functional status. Now, as we said, the <coughs> uh, heart failure is a, a complex and clinical syndrome. So there's not one particular diagnostic test that's going to be the key to, to figure out why someone has heart failure. And so um, over the next few slides, I'm going to build uh, what seems to be very common sense, uh, a toolbox for us to, to, to use in, in, in the initial evaluation. And you'll see that the uh, history and physical examination is largely, it still remains the key. So history and physical exam gives us clues to the etiology of the cardiomyopathy. It gives you an idea of how severe the disease is and also gives you an idea of the patient's uh, uh, volume status and, and the adequacy of their perfusion. And again, this comes straight from the, the latest guidelines on heart failure published in 2013 that Dr. Butler helped write. And <clears throat> you'll see that physical examination and history taking all flight carry class one level recommendations that the, a thorough physical uh, history and physical exam should be obtained in all patients with heart failure. And um, <clears throat> volume status and vital signs assessment are, are, are key. That's no secret. And, and so building the toolbox after that, uh, we can add laboratory results or laboratory evaluations, including uh, complete blood counts, a metabolic panel, natriuretic peptides, uh, markers of myocardial injury, like just a troponin, um, and, and as well as other metabolic uh, signals to get an idea of, of what may be going on. And again, laboratory evaluation, um, uh, as well as an EKG, all carry class one recommendations. So once you see patients with presenting with heart failure after a thorough physical uh, history and physical examination, laboratory and, and EKGs all, all should be done. 
And as far as biomarkers, again, this was coming from the, the 2017 update to the, the, the heart failure guidelines. And as you can see that in the diagnosis, uh, obtaining the levels of uh, BNP or uh, anti-pro-BNP levels uh, carry a class one level of evidence. So that leads us to, to rounding out the toolbox of uh, non-invasive as well as invasive evaluations, whether it's chest x-rays, echocardiograms, or ischemia or viability assessment with using multimodality imaging, of which I will show you examples of, of going forward, as well as invasive evaluations, including heart catheterization, whether it's a left heart or a right heart catheterization. And I'll show you evidence of that. So again, directly from the guidelines, uh, the Anybody that presents with a suspected or a new onset heart failure, a chest x-ray is in order, an echocardiogram is in order, um, and then uh, the 2A level recommendations are things that you, you, you should do, or, or I'm sorry, class one is what you should do, class twos are sort of what you could do, and uh, the could do's are based on, as you can see, sorry, um, th what your suspicion is, based on your history, physical exam, and, um, and laboratory uh, evaluation. Invasive evaluations, uh, we use a lot of Swan-Gans catheters or uh, pulmonary artery catheters, and, and typically in, uh, almost always in the hospital. But uh, the class one recommendation for using a pulmonary artery catheter is in, in those folks with respiratory distress or impaired perfusion, uh, when just a clinical assessment by a physician is, is inadequate. Uh, but you can also, again, class 2A level recommendations uh, in patients with acute heart failure with persistent symptoms when the hemodynamics, again, are uncertain for whatever reason. Uh, coronary evaluations, including a coronary angiogram, uh, is also reasonable to do if you suspect that coronary ischemia is the underlying etiology for heart failure. And the myocardial biopsies that we do, again, uh, it's a level 2A evidence currently uh, that it can be useful in patients when you suspect a specific diagnosis and that it would actually change therapy. So now I'm going to take you through a case, again, of a patient that we recently saw and um, kind of put all those principles and, and the importance of using history, physical exam, and laboratory, and imaging, and invasive evaluations, all those tool, uh, uh, tools into play to ultimately arrive at a diagnosis. So this was a 62-year-old man who presented to the hospital with a two-month history of worsening shortness of breath. It's associated with bilateral lower extremity edema. He's uh, told us that uh, he became more and more short of breath with time and, and to the point where he became now short of breath walking around the house. However, he was comfortable at rest. On review of systems, he has exertional dyspnea with opnea and edema, but he did not have any paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. As far as his medical history, it's hypertension, dyslipidemia, um, and no really pertinent surgical history. These were his medications. He was on aspirin, statin, and uh, lisinopril at a low dose. Uh, his family history, his mother was a diabetic, and father had some sort of heart disease that he was not able to recall. He is an active smoker, one pack per day uh, for many years, and he also is uh, drinking at least three beers a day for quote unquote years. On physical exam, he was afebrile. His blood pressure was in the 140s over 60, so the pulse pressure in the 80s. His heart rate was in the 80s. He was oxygenating well on room air. Um, he appeared well, there was no distress, but his jugular venous pressure was elevated at 13 centimeters of water. He had a bounding carotid pulse. His cardiac exam showed uh, normal S1 and S2, but an S3 was audible. He also had a uh, two out of six crescendo, decrescendo murmur for the left upper stonal border, but also a one out of, uh, sorry, a <clears throat> two out of four uh, blowing diastolic murmur that was appreciated along the left, uh, the sternal border. His point of maximal impulse for the PMI was laterally displaced. His lung exam showed that he had decreased breath sounds at the bases, right side more than left. He also had faint rails on exam. His abdomen was mildly distended. He had hepatomegaly. Um, and his extremities were warm, but he had at least two plus edema to the level of the shins. So I bring that, in. it's important because now I'm gonna show you all kinds of numbers in terms of laboratory results, but the, the summary of this is that he's mildly anemic with a hemoglobin of 10. He was hyponatremic. He was in renal failure with a creatinine of 1.4 with a baseline that was sub one. 
Um, his AST and ALT were elevated with a patocellular injury pattern. It's consistent with the patocongestion congestion and on the exam. <clears throat> he was a diabetic, technically, with an A1C of 6.6. .6. His BNP was elevated, uh, but the other, rest of the other uh, uh, laboratory results were largely unremarkable. What I didn't show you on here was his lipid profile. He was taking a statin. His LDL was less than 100. His total cholesterol was within a normal range at this point. This was his EKG, so this uh, shows a sinus rhythm at the first degree AV block. Uh, he's got a left axis deviation. He has a uh, tall R wave in V1 with R wave decrement across the recordial leads. All this is to show you that this is a very abnormal EKG with potentially right ventricular hypertrophy. So already, uh, I'm sorry, then this is, was his chest x-ray. I apologize for the lateral view that didn't project as well, but uh, one thing that stands out clearly is it's got cardiomegaly uh, with uh, some pleural fusions and vascular congestion. So I have not even shown you an echocardiogram yet. Um, but I bet most of the folks know that this person is in heart failure. This is a 62-year-old man with risk factors of hypertension, dyslipidemia, as an active smoker, who, who presented with symptoms of volume overload with right-sided and left-sided heart failure, shorter breath, um, but he also had edema. And uh, the x-ray showed cardiomegaly. So how do we actually present, now how do we uh, evaluate or, or study the etiology of his cardiomyopathy? Well, so in the physical exam that I showed you, I told you that his PMI was laterally, laterally displaced, so it tells you right away that the, the, the heart is likely remodeled and enlarged. He had an S3, which also tells you that the um, patient's um, not only remodeled, but also volume overloaded, and, and the, the x-ray showed you that the, the cardiac silhouette was enlarged. So based on that, your differential already starts that this person has a dilated cardiomyopathy, and uh, you suspect the patient has a reduced ejection fraction. So if you proceed with an echocardiogram, you see what you expect to see. The patient has a, um, a, a large left ventricle. I'll tell you this was a 7.5 centimeter left ventricle. The upper limit of normal for a man is in the 5 range. Uh, his ejection fraction was low. This was calculated in the 20 to 25 percent range. Um, and uh, this doesn't show it as well, I'll show you better later, but the right ventricle also is very dilated and the right ventricular function was, was decreased as well. So now based on just the history and physical exam alone and now the echocardiogram confirms that you have a, a patient with a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So now what may have caused this? Well, he has risk factors of hypertension, dyslipidemia, he's a smoker. And his father had this heart disease that we're not able to um, get further details on, but that could have been that the patient had a, uh, the father had a premature MI. So he has risk factors for ischemic heart disease. So uh, again, based on the guidelines, one of the things that you could do is do an ischemia evaluation to see if that's what is causing heart failure. Uh, this is, uh, these are cardiac MRI images, and I'm going to show you the heart uh, coronary angiogram next. It didn't happen in this order, but I just wanted to show you to this way. So to give you an idea that uh, cardiac MRI can also get, be useful in, uh, in, in looking for ischemia. So the top row here is a four-chamber, a two-chamber, and three-chamber uh, view of the heart. And uh, this is just a cine image that shows, again, that the heart is enlarged, biventricular enlargement, with uh, reduced ejection fraction both on the left and the right sides. And then the bottom row of images here is uh, delayed enhancement using contrast. And uh, this is to try and show you at multiple levels that there's no evidence of any uh, scar uh, on the MRI. Now, I did show you that the patient did have a, a coronary angiogram. I'll tell you, this was, once we get to the final diagnosis, you'll see why. Um, can we get these to play in the back? Um, but I'll show you that this was, the, these uh, three images showed the left-sided coronary um, circulation. There we go. Um, so these three show the left-sided coronary circulation that shows really non-obstructive coronary disease. He does have some uh, a faint uh, uh, lesion, maybe perhaps in the proximal LAD, but nothing significant. And the, the image down in the bottom right-hand corner shows the right coronary artery, which, again, doesn't show any obstructive lesions. 
So based on the cardiac MRI, that shows no scar and no, is, uh, no ischemia. Um, <clears throat> and uh, having done a coronary angiogram, we have now effectively rolled out ischemic heart disease as the etiology. So then what's next? So the, again, going back to the physical exam, and, and uh, <clears throat> we know that the patient has a diastolic murmur. Uh, the patient's, uh, the ventricle is dilated. He has a wide pulse pressure in the 80 millimeters of mercury, and he had a very bounding carotid pulse. So those are all physical exam findings uh, that make you suspect valvular pathology, in particular uh, aortic insufficiency. So <clears throat> when we go back to the echocardiogram, this is now a zoomed-in uh, image on the aortic valve on a parasternal long-axis image with Doppler signals going across the aortic valve. It shows that there's pretty turbulent flow on, on a parasternal long. This is now what's the, the, a five-chamber view uh, with this, the, the left ventricular outflow tract here, and this uh, color Doppler signal is pr uh, pr uh, placed over the aortic valve. And you see this uh, turbulence here is it's suggestive of aortic insufficiency. And it's a, uh, a, at least moderate, uh, if not severe. So how do we determine the severity? Well, this is now looking at the aortic arch. Again, flow uh, turbulence here. Uh, this is now flow reversal uh, with Doppler signals uh, that show that there's holo uh, 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 diastolic re flow reversal in systole here uh, that confirms a severe uh, aortic insufficiency. Now, going back to the cardiac MR, MRI, this is an LVOT image. Uh, again, that three-chamber view that shows color flow and, and or shows flow. And you can see that there is a, a, a regurgitant a lesion there. And when you look on the short axis, it, it, can, it shows that not only is there aortic insufficiency, but the patient also has a bicuspid aortic valve. So using all of those tools of physical examination, the laboratory results, x-rays, EKG, echocardiogram, and ischemia evaluation, cardiac MRI, all those tools led us to this diagnosis, the patient presenting with an acute systolic and diastolic heart failure. He was in stage C uh, with NYHA functional class three symptoms. This was a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, with severe aortic regurgitation, likely chronic, uh, associated with a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, so to wrap up, this is, uh, an, I look for an algorithm to try and uh, figure out if we can put all that in, in a nice table. I was unable to, but the Canadian Cardiovascular Society put one up, so I figured I'd share that with you. Um, essentially, it takes you through a nice flow chart that says you can start with a history and physical examination, all those things. That, uh, that I referred to earlier, and once you diagnose somebody with heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction, you proceed with common etiology such as hypertension, coronary disease, um, or any valvular insufficiencies. Once uh, those are ruled out uh, with appropriate testing based on your history, um, then some of the more less, less common uh, etiologies such as uh, 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 exposure to toxins such as chemotherapy, the viruses, the hundred different reasons that Dr. Butler referred to in his talk of having a, a, a cardiomyopathy uh, should be all guided by uh, whatever the history that you're able to elicit. If there is lots of uh, exposure to toxic agents or if the patient had a, um, uh, if you're suspecting any kind of um, hereditary lesions uh, such as uh, non-compaction or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or amyloidosis, all these other etiologies, um, it should be largely guided by uh, a history and physical exam and, and, and the uh, ancillary testing that's available to us. So just in summary, the, again, history and physical exam remain the cornerstone to the initial evaluation of heart failure and be mindful of the risk factors that led to that patient uh, showing up on your doorstep to guide the workup of the etiology. Thank you very much. <clears throat>